Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Emmy Vadness, co-host with Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is compassion with addiction. My guest is Dr. Carrie Wilkins, who is the co-founder and clinical director of the Center for Motivation and Change. She has developed a unique approach called the Invitation for Change to help loved ones who are struggling with substance use issues. She is author and co-author of several books, including The Parent's 20-Minute Guide to Change, a guide for parents about how to help their children change their substance use, The Partner's 20-Minute Guide, a guide for partners about how to help their loved ones change their substance use, Beyond Addiction, How Science and Kindness Help People Change, and The Beyond Addiction Workbook for Family and Friends. Carrie is located in the New York area, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Carrie. It's such a pleasure to have you with us on New Thinking Aloud today. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Most people think that when someone is struggling with substance use issues, they have to hit rock bottom before they can recover. Yet your research has shown otherwise. Yeah, that is unfortunately one of the biggest myths out there um, that our foundation and my literally my career is devoted to changing that perception um, because it's not true. And um, it's actually contributing to, I think, a a significant loss of life um, because families or friends are being told that there's nothing they can do and they can actually have an incredibly positive influence on loved ones and with fentanyl and everything that's out in the marketplace now, um, people are overdosing and people are dying. um, And it just doesn't have to be that way. Um, And that messaging of you have to hit rock bottom is detrimental to the person with the substance use problem. And it's detrimental to their family and friends, um, because it's sending them sending them a hopeless message, um, because rock bottom really might mean death now um, with fentanyl around. Why do you think that myth has become so popular? Substance use problems are one of the most stigmatized problems. Um, and in our culture and lots of cultures around the world, um, you know, the, the idea is that people who use substances are weak. They're morally bankrupt. They have character problems. You know, there's all these deficits that contribute to them deciding to go down the path of using substances. Um, That narrative has been around for a very, very long time. Um, And they're hard to understand, right? When you've got a loved one or a friend who's doing something incredibly destructive, um, it's scary and it's upsetting and confusing. And unfortunately, we humans tend to sometimes deal with our fear by getting angry (laughs) and punishing. Um, It makes us feel like we have some control, um, instead of actually wrestling with, wow, why is this person gravitating to drugs and alcohol? What are they getting out of it? Um, And I think when you start to explore the why behind the substance use, you end up facing all sorts of societal ills, for lack of a better (laughs) way of phrasing it, um, that contribute to people deciding to go down that path. Um, And I think that's actually hard to look at. Uh, So we, we, we would rather think the person is the problem versus the culture and society around them being the problem because that's a it's harder to fix, right? Absolutely. And do you think that the rock bottom perception is because it's thought that until a person loses so much, they won't be motivated to change? Is that necessarily true? Yeah, so that is definitely part of the part of what drives that idea is that there's no way you can influence somebody's motivation. And that's actually what the science has spent, you know, the last 25 years disproving, which is, um, you know, there's very specific strategies that we use as therapists. um, And we've actually put in our approach for families, um, which are communication strategies that can actually activate somebody's motivation and create a conversation and create a platform where you can be 
having a positive influence on somebody's motivation. You can also think about the world around them, you know, and what can you do as a person to influence the world around them that makes change more likely, that makes change easier to obtain. Um, there's lots of roadblocks to change. And if we can, as helpers, get some of those roadblocks out of the way because we're thinking strategically, um, we can have a huge impl- influence on somebody's motivation. Um, I can have an influence on your motivation just in how I talk to you. I can make you defensive and I can make you hunker down and hang on to your <laughs> whatever it is that you're wanting to hang on to, or I can create an environment where you're more curious um, and you're willing to say, yeah, I'm not totally happy with what I'm doing. Um, so we really try to help family members think about how they're approaching communication um, and treatment providers too. Um, but we have, we have courses we can take about how to do this. Right. Um, but part of our idea is that we want to help lay people also take use these same strategies. Yeah. Well, so many people are dealing with substance use issues and it becomes complicated because there are prescription medications that people use. People sell them on the streets. And then now recreational marijuana is really sweeping the country here in the U.S. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> everybody knows somebody. I mean, I, I say to people all the time, everybody knows somebody who's struggling with substances. Um, and the most frequent, you know, I mean, I know people are worried about cannabis and worried about opioids. The, the two biggest substances that are causing loss of life are nicotine and alcohol, you know, so those are our biggest problems still, and nobody talks about them. Nobody, you know, I had a, I did a radio interview with somebody a while ago, and he said, I'm just so relieved. I don't have anybody in my life who has an addiction problem. And I said, really, that's really unusual. Like most people know somebody. And he's like, well, you know, my dad died of emphysema. He was a lifelong smoker. And I'm like, okay, so he had a very significant substance problem, like your whole life, but he, there's a disconnect in terms of thinking, that that's problematic. Um, so I, I just encourage people to really stay focused on alcohol and cigarettes um, as the main problem still. Um, and yes, cannabis is more available and causing all sorts of problems. I think it's very difficult to be a parent now in places where there's lots of cannabis accessible because teens can do stuff in their bedroom that previously we could disrupt because you could smell you could smell pot, right? Like you could, like if your kid was smoking pot in their bedroom, you could smell it. Now you can't um, because they're doing edibles and they're vaping and they're doing all sorts of things. So I think it's very difficult for parents to kind of figure out what's happening. So it's definitely gotten more complicated. Can you tell us a little bit about your invitation to change approach and what is unique about that? Yeah. So the invitation to change approach is um, we've developed that over the last five years in directly working with family members who are in their community trying to help other family members. Um, And the main, so it's comprised of several different evidence-based strategies. Um, The biggest one is something called community reinforcement and family training craft, which is an approach that family members can learn to have a positive influence on the person using substances. And, um, you know, there's two decades worth of research about how effective craft is when they, when they do head to head trials of family members doing craft family members doing an intervention and family members doing Al-Anon craft gets your loved one into treatment, like 65, 75% of the time interventions get your loved one into treatment about 10, 15% of the time, and Al-Anon gets your loved one into treatment like 3% of the time. Al-Anon's not designed to get your loved one into treatment. Al-Anon is a lovely self-help organization for people to get peer support, right? But most family members really want their loved one into treatment. Like they want strategies to try to have an influence on their loved one. And Al-Anon unfortunately does kind of send the message of, there's nothing really you can do except take care of yourself. which is an important message, but it's not the whole, it's not the whole thing. Interventions are problematic because sure, they can get people into treatment, but you often end up getting your loved one into treatment and having fractured your family. They're in treatment, but they're furious at the family um, and they're furious about being in treatment. So that's not the best, (laughs) that's not the best way to enter treatment. Um, and the problem with interventions is also a lot of family members drop out. They, they, they start the process and then they're like, I can't actually do this. Um, so it's not particularly effective if most people drop out, right? And they're incredibly expensive. 
and then um, craft gets loved ones into treatment. And then the, the interesting finding in these studies is that the family member's mental health went up. So family members felt better. And the person with the substance use, their substance use was down before they even started treatment. So the, the approach has this really nice impact on the family. So we've been training people in craft for years. But one of the things that we realized in training people in craft is that most people have like this messaging from our culture in their heads, this idea of like, I can't do anything. They've got to hit rock bottom or I've got to use tough love or I've got to confront the problem or I'm codependent if I try to help. Right. They have all these like stereotypical stigmatized ideas in their head. So and craft is all about positive reinforcement. So it's kind of the exact opposite of that messaging. And it was very hard for family members to like pick up craft. So the invitation to change is our attempt to have all of the craft skills, but with this added component of we actually want to change your perception and and how you understand substance use problems and behavior change in general, um, which is this idea that behaviors make sense, right? So people use substances because they work in some way. Um, You know, people don't use substances because they're bad people or selfish people or they, anything, they use it because they work in some way. Um, so if as a treatment provider and as a loved one, you can step back and be like, okay, yes, that behavior is scary. It's causing all sorts of problems. But what does my loved one get from the substance use? Like, why are they using it? Um, because then you can start to be curious about that underlying issue and start to go at that and kind of create like, are there other ways they can get that need met? You know, is there something that I can do as a family member that would help them like if my kid's smoking pot because they're socially anxious, can I help them with that social anxiety? You know, can I can I do something to help their social engagement or help them get skills so that they don't have to turn to cannabis in order to connect with their friends? Um, does my partner drink four drinks at the end of every day because they're stressed from work? Can we do something as a couple to reduce stress in a different way? You know, so it just gives them a different way to kind of think about pos- how to posit positively influence their loved one. The other part of it is this idea of one size doesn't fit all. We also as a culture tend to think you got to go to rehab, you got to go to Al-Anon meetings, you got to go to AA, like there's kind of this idea of like there's only one way to be sober. There's a million different ways that people change, right? Um, you know, whether it's like I I join a faith-based group, I learn to meditate, I do yoga, I start exercising, like there's so many people develop the problem for so many different ways, and they get out of the problem in so many ways. And if we can kind of expand people's idea of what is help, um, you really (laughs) open the door to lots of opportunity. Um, And then the third component of that is just ambivalence is normal, because people also like ambivalence is a scary thing, right? Like if you really want your loved one to change and all of a sudden they're getting ambivalent, you want to force them back into changing, right? Which again, just increases defensiveness and will send people underground versus being like, oh, why are you, what's what's changing your mind here? Like what about your environment is making you ambivalent? Um, and can we work with that in a different way? So we added all of that. And then the other part that we added is um, compassion um, for the person with the problem and for the caretaker, because like this is having somebody with a serious substance use problem or mental health problem for that matter in your family is incredibly taxing and draining. And, you know, there's a fair amount of studies that family members are stigmatized and judged. You know, if, if my child has a substance use problem, other parents are thinking, I'm a bad parent. Um, that's actually been shown in research that people think that. So, and people know that they feel that. Um, so we added a lot of compassion just for this idea that behavior change takes a long time. Um, you as a family member have strategies that you could benefit from learning your loved one as they change. It's going to take time. They're going to have to practice. They're going to screw up. And if we don't have compassion for the learning process, it's going to be way more stressful than it needs to be. Um, and people are going to give up. So we really added this idea of compassion um, in in the approach. Mm-hmm. And can you give an example of how compassion has helped someone with their substance use issues? Well, going back to what I said before, um, having an addiction problem, it is a very stigmatized problem. Like I've, I mean, I've been doing this for 
over 20 years and I've never met somebody who wanted to have a substance use problem. They feel bad about it. Um, they feel out of control. They know they're judged. They know their family, they know they're causing harm. Um, they don't know how to stop. Um, you know, they don't know how to change, but they feel bad. And that often keeps people from engaging in treatment, you know, and they're skeptical that they can be helped. Um, you know, so there's all sorts of ways that this plays out in terms of that harsh internal critic. Um, and sometimes people end up using substances because for whatever reason, whether it's trauma in their childhood or, you know, just things in their environment cause them to not have compassion for themselves. Like they feel bad about themselves. Um, and substances can sometimes numb that. So they're using substances um, to try to soften some of these hard edges um, that people just have in their, in the way they treat themselves and how they think about themselves. So compassion it's hard for people. And, um, you know, like when we train people in like, we got to bring some compassion to this, like just to acknowledge your own suffering, to acknowledge how hard making changes is people balk at it. You know, they're just like, oh, I should, I should just be able to do this. And it's like, well, <laughs> sure. If, if that were as easy, you would have done it by now. Like this is actually hard. So let's actually talk about what's hard about it and give you some space to acknowledge what's hard about it. And then to try to have the whole family system take that approach of, yeah, this is hard on the entire family. And how do we support each other and be compassionate for every person in the family system possibly needing to make some changes um, in terms of how they relate to each other? And I'm working with this family now who um, they're trying to support their 20 something year old son um, coming home for the holidays. And they're a pretty heavy drinking family just as a norm and he's trying not to drink and they're really struggling with do we do we not have alcohol at the family event that would be hard for everybody he doesn't want people to make changes you know just for him meanwhile being around everybody drinking would be really hard for him you know so it's just this like there's just like decisions like that that are really complicated and hard um so again to just induce this idea of okay can you just have some compassion for yourselves that everybody here is having to make changes, right? And it feels awkward and it's hard. Um, and let's just be gentle with that as opposed to pretending like it should just be easy because it's, it's just not, it's not easy. There's a lot of shame associated with substance use. Massive, massive amount. Um, and I, you know, the, um, the complicating issue is also they think that anywhere between like kind of 55 and 75% of people seeking treatment for substance use problems have trauma, you know, as their kind of driving force in there. Um, so those people often have childhoods or life experiences where they have shame associated with the trauma. And then you compound that with, and I'm using substances, um, and I feel even worse about myself or people with um, significant mental health issues. Um, you know, I'm working with a couple of people right now who have said, you know, they've both got one young man has a, a, a psychotic issue. Um, he just got diagnosed with schizophrenia and another young woman got diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And both of them have said to me, I would rather be a drug addict than have a serious mental illness. Um, so they've got these two issues that bring them a massive amount of shame in terms of feeling different and feeling um, like they're a problem. And, you know, so to really f come from a strength-based place where you're really trying to help people like, yeah, you have these struggles and you have all these strengths. So how can we help you hang on to and stay in touch with your strengths um, and use those strengths to build the, the life that you want in spite of what you struggle with, right? Can you bring that struggle along with you as opposed to feeling like you have to hide it um, because of shame? And then the other thing is like people do all sorts of things when they're in the throes of a substance use problem that then when they stop, they just feel horrible about, you know, just whether I've taken money from people I love or said or done things that I regret. Um, you know, there's often a lot of shame associated with that. Um, and one of the ways that we work with it is we say like, there's a big difference between shame. Shame cuts you off from people, right? It makes you feel different and makes you feel like I can't possibly join the human race because I'm so full of shame versus like regret because regret, like you can apologize, you can make amends, you can, you can acknowledge what happened and say, I don't want this to happen again. Like you can move 
towards positive changes. Um, whereas I think shame just causes people to go it fully into isolation mode. Um, and that's for the person with the problem and for family members. Um, cause family members, you know, like if you're scared and your loved one's stealing from you, like they'll, they will often do and say things that they regret to Like I've had so many parents who are like, I cannot believe I did that to my kid or I said that to my kid, you know, so to really help them. And that's where that compassion comes back in. Right. Of like, okay, yeah, you were in a terrible state when you said that. Um, and can you have some compassion for yourself and move forward with that as opposed to feeling like you have to cut yourself off and hide because you feel like you're the worst person on the planet. It's you're human and we humans struggle. <laughs> Your approach helps the loved one have more compassion for those who are dealing with substance use issues, having compassion for themselves and those who are using substances have compassion for themselves as well. How do you, uh, guide someone who is using to be more compassionate with themselves? Usually by trying to help them kind of see how being not compassionate is impacting them, <laughs> right? Um, you know, like when somebody's trying to make behavior change and they're, and because one of the things that we also talk a lot about is this idea of practice, you know, that if you can't just take out the part of your brain that was using substances, right? Like those memory pathways are in there. You've got to learn new things on top of it. So in that learning process, you're going to feel awkward. You're not going to know what to do. You're going to make errors, you know, and if you relate to every mistake you make in your recovery process, like, oh, I, I relapsed. See, I wasn't serious. Maybe I'm not serious, right? That's going to send you back to deciding to continue using because you feel like I just have to give up. I, I can't, I can't do this versus like, wow, I just slipped up. I returned to use. What happened? You know, what did I not, what did I not anticipate? Well, like what part of my plan didn't work out? How can I, how can I take this as an opportunity to learn and move forward? Um, so that the compassion is in that understanding that you're in a learning process. Right. Um, and you've got to like have compassion for the stuff that you don't know. You don't you don't know how to. I, one of the ways that I talk about it is I say to people, you know, whatever your goal is, like say your goal is sobriety. Sobriety is a learned behavior and it's learned over a pr usually a pretty significant period of time for most people. It's not like you just decide one day to be sober. You decide and then you have to practice being sober, <laughs> right? And you have to practice again and again and again in lots of different circumstances. And odds are you're not going to be perfect in that learning process. So how can you stay engaged with it? And I think that's where compassion is incredibly important to just be like, okay, okay. I'm, you know, or I'm having a hard time with my feelings. I take the substance use out. Lo and behold, I have depression or lo and behold, I'm really anxious and life is hard for me. How do you have compassion for oh, those feelings are painful and you don't quite know how to cope with them yet. So can we help you learn coping strategies, which again, take time um, and you might be suffering, you know, or you stop using and realize how much you've lost in your life. Can you bring compassion to that suffering um, instead of being incredibly hard on yourself and feeling like you shouldn't have feelings about stuff? Um, so there's different people, you know, where that compassion needs to live, it's going to be different for each person with the problem. An element of compassion or a significant element is being non-judgmental. And at the same time, people who are dealing with this recognize that there's something that's not quite right. And even behind that, do you find that there's an element of a person not liking or even loving themselves? I think that's true. For a fair number of people, you know, again, going back to that trauma, you know, like if you grew up in an environment where you weren't taken care of or were actually abused or neglected in some way, like we learn how to take care of ourselves within our family systems, you know, in terms of where we grew up, like that's how you learn to take care of yourself. Um, so if you grew up in a system where that learning didn't happen and you found a way to take care of yourself with substances, which people often do. It's like, okay, I don't know, you know, say I have anxiety or fear, right? And I'm growing up in an environment where nobody talks about fear, nobody manages fear well, you know, and I'm a temperamentally anxious kid and I discover pot 
or I discover alcohol as a teenager and I realize like, oh, I'm not anxious anymore. I can have a drink and go hang out with people and I'm not anxious. I've learned that alcohol works, right? And then if I keep doing that for 15 years, using alcohol to manage my anxiety and then decide to take alcohol out, I'm going to have a lot of anxiety that I don't know how to deal with because I've skipped over a bunch of learning, right? So um, being able to kind of unwind, okay, how did this get started? You know, like, where did it start for you? Um, Odds are there's a bunch of learning right there in that space that needs to then start to happen. Or I don't know how to communicate very well. You know, my, my relationships are superficial. I'm lonely in my relationships or I don't know how to connect with others or, you know, whatever it is for somebody or somebody who gets really angry and I hurt people when I'm angry. You're going to have to learn other ways to go about this, right? If your relationships are going to be richer and that takes me right back to that idea of practice and learning, right? Like, sure, I'm trying not to drink, but I might also be having to learn how to deal with my anger in a different way. Um, and so I'm, I'm having to learn two new things, um, which can be complicated for people. The teenager in the bedroom using marijuana to soothe their anxiety or for whatever reason, sometimes in that situation, the parents themselves might also be using because, or, you know, where is that line of what is an addiction versus somebody is, is using it for more, quote, recreational use? Well, so that's a multi-layered question there, because um, one of the most striking things that is coming out of science around just trying to understand um, the legalization of cannabis and like what kind of impact that's having, um, the studies they do on adolescents is it actually really does affect literally intelligence like IQ. Um, So if you can keep cannabis out of your teenager's brain, you're doing them a huge service. (laughs) I'm always, I just tell parents like, and cannabis is very different, you know, so what you might've been using as, you know, if you're a 50 year old parent and what you were smoking when you were 18 or 20, it's completely different now. Um, The the strains are more intense. Um, You know, they've got again, more access. The potency is significantly more. So it's just a whole different ball of, it's a whole different ball game. Um, and we do know it really impacts motivation. It impacts learning and it impacts, um, IQ. So if you can just work with your kid to say, I know it's around, I know everybody's doing it. And can we just protect your brain until you're like 19, 20, <laughs> like we'll be doing great. And then you can make a decision for yourself. Um, so I, and then I think if, if, if a parent is noticing, Oh, I'm having a hard time having my kid trying to get my kid to say no to this because I know I'm using it. It's probably worth like seeing if you can not use it and examine why you're using it. Um, and can you make changes? Um, which is oftentimes an interesting exercise for parents, right? Of like, Oh, it actually is hard. You know, I'm asking my kid to do something hard. Um, you know, when I'm saying don't do that, right? Because I'm having a hard time not doing it. Um, and just be curious about that and examine like, what is it about my life that I'm not managing? Why am I turning to a substance? You know, can I can I get my needs met in another way? You know, do I need to reduce my stress in some other way? Um, and use yourself as a role model with your kid. I mean, I think that can be a, like a really nice thing for a parent kid dynamic of a parent being like, you know what, I realized I was doing it a little bit too much. So I'm going to, I'm going to take it off the table too. Cause I don't want to, I don't want to do that while I'm asking you not to do that. Um, it's, that's an interesting learning opportunity for a kid. Is cannabis considered a gateway drug? Like some people think. <laughs> <laughs> um, nicotine, it's going back to those cigarettes. Um, uh, you know, I mean, sure. I mean, there's going to be some people who end up smoking cannabis and like, going on to other things, you know, it's not, it's, it's, it's not that kind of headline as much as um, people would like it to be a headline. Um, But again, it will, it, it really adversely affects motivation um, and learning. So if you can not have your teenager, but I, I'm a little bit of a zealot when it comes to nicotine, I'm, you know, you should be equally worried if your kid is smoking cigarettes. Um, and alcohol use, those two things, like, you know, the, the earlier a teen uses nicotine and alcohol, that's predictive of ongoing 
substance use, if they're heavy smokers and heavy drinkers as teenagers, there's a risk that they're going to go on to have other significant problems. So um, we like to talk about all these other substances and we don't worry about alcohol and nicotine when those two things are really what drive a lot. Well, just to echo your message you want to share around nicotine, I was about four years old when my grandfather was sadly dying of emphysema or known as COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And it was very sad to witness that. I came of age when smoking cigarettes was considered cool. And I actually did happen to smoke cigarettes for a number of years. And I trained as an occupational therapist and in my early 20s, I actually was working in a nursing home helping a woman who was in her 50s. She was in her mid-50s. She was on the max liters of oxygen you could have. And she would go from her bed to her chair, which was just about two feet away. And she said she felt like she had just run around the block. And then I went home and I would take my bike and go for a bike ride, take my cigarettes with me. And I thought, what am I doing? I was so addicted and even though I, I had that experience with my grandfather and, you know, became a medical profession, professional and it took really multiple experiences for me to recognize the long-term effects. And I think a lot of people don't realize that it, that over time it really does impact you. Nicotine for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, that's the problem with, um, cigarette smoking and nicotine is the the health consequences are much later, right? So you're causing yourself damage, but you don't feel it in the moment um, in a very different way than some of these other substances. You know, if you drink too much, you wake up the next day and you have a hangover. Like it's, it's kind of, you immediately feel like, oh, I don't like how that felt. Um, nicotine, you don't feel you feel better, right? When you smoke a cigarette because you're getting yourself out of nicotine withdrawal. So it feels better in the moment. Um, so that's part of what makes it really complicated for people. But, you know, nicotine, like it, it messes with all sorts of our metabolic systems, you know, I mean, it, it's a stimulant, um, you know, so it's, it's, it's affecting your diet. It's affecting your sleep. It's affecting anxiety levels. It's affecting all sorts of stuff. But when you're really addicted to nicotine, you just want to be out of nicotine withdrawal. Um, and that's really what your brain is focused on. Um, you're not, you're not imagining having emphysema when you're 75, if you're smoking daily as a 20 year old, you're a long ways away from that. So, um, nicotine is actually one of the hardest things for people to kick. Um, you know, it's really, it's, and I think that's true for cannabis too. You know, some of these like young adults who are daily smokers, it's very hard for them, you know, cause it's like nothing really terrible is happening. You know, they're just kind of like, they're just underperforming. They're just kind of not doing anything. They're just hanging out. Um, so it's not like a crisis. Um, and all of a sudden they're like 28 years old and are like, Oh, I, I haven't done much. Um, <laughs> you know, which is like unfortunate and painful. Um, but, um, so those two things, cannabis and nicotine are, are difficult in those ways because they're just, the effects are not, instantly uncomfortable. Right. With cannabis, it can be further complicated because if we take the young adult example, sometimes the parents might try CBD or medical marijuana or even for themselves. And so it's almost as though sometimes people might feel like they're getting mixed messages. I just want to be clear, like I'm not against people using medical marijuana. And I, like, I think the criminalization of substances has really set back what we could have been using in terms of psychedelics and medical marijuana. And there's all sorts of things in there that are worth exploring. But if you're trying to have a substance in your life, you know, whether it's alcohol or cannabis or whatever it is, like really being honest with yourself in looking at that kind of cost benefit ratio of is what I'm getting out of this substance really outweighing the consequences. And am I really being honest about the consequences, right? Am I really like, examining those in terms of, you know, if I'm smoking cannabis at the end of the night, pot at the end of the night, sure, I might be more relaxed, I might sleep better, but am I neglecting my relationship? You know, am I not going to the gym? Is there something else I could be doing that would be more life enhancing? Um, and I, I just tell people like, just to check yourself, do you, are you dependent? Even if it's not like totally physically dependent, are you emotionally dependent on a substance? Um, and is that really what you want? 
you know, is there, do you feel like this is the only way I can relax? This is the only way I can connect with people. And do you want to establish some more flexibility in there for yourself? Um, so I just, I just encourage people to take a critical look at themselves and their relationships and just the impact that substances are having on you. Because it also changes over the course of a lifetime, you know, like how you were having drinks in your 20s. It might really affect you differently as a 55 year old woman, you know, as a 60 year old woman going through menopause, like you, you, maybe you had two drinks, three drinks successfully with no consequences, never thought anything about it. Suddenly your hormones change, you get a little older and it's impacting you more. Like, can you pay attention to that and be like, okay, I don't actually want to do that. I need to shift gears here. So we just trying to help people not get in some ha mindless habit. You want to stay intentional and thoughtful and have a healthy relationship with whatever you're putting in your body. Where is the line of what is an addiction? And I think you gave some examples just now. And because sometimes people might be wondering, well, quote, am I an alcoholic or not, for example? Yeah, I, I don't even use those words um, because nobody wants to be an alcoholic, right? So if you say, am I an alcoholic? Most people will be like, no, I don't want to be that. <laughs> so, which prevents them from being able to, again, kind of critically examine what's happening for me. Um, so the way it's diagnosed is on a spectrum of severity. And um, again, it's just really like, are you persisting in the behavior? You know, so are you continuing to drink or smoke pot or whatever it is, in spite of consequences that are actually meaningful in your life? Um, you know, do you keep going to the behavior, even though it's actually causing you significant problems? And then, you know, with some of the substances, like, you know, do you have increased tolerance? Are you needing more and more and more? You know, if you take the substance out, do you feel withdrawal symptoms? You know, like if you don't drink for two or three days, do you start to feel crabby? You know, are you more anxious? Are you having a harder time regulating? Well, maybe, maybe those drinks at the end of the night are doing a little bit too much for you and you need to like actually take it out for a while and figure out how to deal with your emotions in a different way. So those tend to be the three things that I encourage people to look at is just, are you incurring consequences that you wish you weren't? Um, <laughs> like, are, is your tolerance going up? And if you take it out, do you really miss it? And do you have cravings? Um, because if you really miss it and you're having cravings, you're probably a little bit too dependent on it. And some people are very dependent on it. So it's just being able to look at those three things. How can a loved one help those who might be suffering with substance use issues be compassionate without necessarily enabling them? So that's all spelled out in our workbook. Um, the Beyond Addiction Workbook, and it's also in Beyond Addiction, How Science and Kindness Help People Change, are two books, because um, it's a combination of things, and it's different at different times, right? So enabling is, again, a word that gets tossed around, and people, like, if you ask 10 different people what enabling is, or 10 different people what codependency is, you're going to get 10 different answers, right? So I'm, those words, are for me, are just kind of meaningless words. Um, enabling is when you're inadvertently doing something that supports the use, you know, whether it's like, okay, my loved one is constantly running out of money. I'm giving them money and they're using it on substances. Um, you know, they say, oh, I can't pay my rent. I give them rent money and they go use substances and they don't pay their rent. Right. So that, that would be kind of like classic definition of enabling part of these strategies that are in the invitation to change approach is really helping loved ones focus on um, reinforcement. So what are healthy, sober behaviors that I can reinforce and support? How do I let natural consequences actually play a role? Um, you know, one example I give a lot is this woman that I worked with for years, her husband would come home from work, and he would kind of sit down in his living room chair and drink beer and would fall asleep in his chair, right? She would clean it all up. She'd get him up to bed. She'd be furious, right? She'd be so mad at him for doing this every single night. Um, she'd be mad at him in the morning and he would think she's difficult. Like she's such a crab in the morning because he wouldn't remember, right? So she was trying to protect him from the teenagers seeing him that way in the morning. And so what she did was she started to leave him there. 
So she would just go to bed. She'd leave him in his chair surrounded by beer cans. And the kids would walk to breakfast and walk past him and find him passed out there, which was painful for them, but it was more painful for him. And he woke up and he was embarrassed. He didn't want his kids to see that way, you know, and he, and he realized, wow, I passed out last night. Whenever he, she got him up to bed, he wouldn't remember that he, he just thought he walked up to bed. He wouldn't realize that she actually got him there. So when he started to realize I'm passing out at night and my kids are seeing me, that was motiv motivating for him. Um, you know, and instead of thinking my wife's a nightmare for being mad at me every single morning, he was actually able to kind of look at himself. So that's an example of like, that was a naturally occurring consequence that was meaningful, right? And helped him shift. And then the other part of the invitation approach is a variety of different communication strategies that really help people talk about the problem, make suggestions, offer to help, um, because usually relationships are pretty fraught with lots of communication breakdown by the time somebody's got a pretty significant substance problem. <laughs> There's usually lots of fighting and lots of, lots of bad communication. So um, we try to help family members shift how they communicate so that we can lower defensiveness um, and create, you know, discussions that a, you understand your loved one better, but you can also make suggestions about how they might change and how you can possibly be helpful. Um, so it's a lot of different things and embedded in all of that is how do you take care of yourself in this process, right? Because it's not about just running around rescuing your loved one. It's really being, it's being intentional. It's being strategic. It's making sure your life is not getting sacrificed, you know, while you try to help your loved one. Um, so we're also really working on trying to help them keep their balance in that way too. When a loved one of those who are dealing with the substance use issues are able to stay involved with the person's life in a loving, compassionate, meaningful way, it seems that that would help the person who is using feel less shame and feel more supported, therefore perhaps even being more motivated to want to improve their lives. Yeah. Yeah, there's a mom that we use her as an example um her son was using opiates um and she was terrified he was going to overdose um and you know they'd been fighting and lots of problems and she really was like i have to be able to communicate with my son so she started working on all these strategies and he um i mean it's a heartbreaking story she was in the living room and he came out of his bedroom and he said mom i think i'm overdosing and she, he she had Narcan and she was able to, you know, keep him from overdosing in that moment. And after the fact, he said to her, I felt like I could come tell you. So even though that was a terrifying thing to have her child told, you know, tell her, and she wishes he hadn't been using, of course, she created an environment where he could come to her, you know, which ultimately saved his life. Um, and he's now on a better path and he's making positive changes now. But it was really like working on those communication strategies helped her in that helped get them to that place, you know, where he didn't hide from her. Um, so even though on the surface, that looks like difficult, right? Her son is using drugs in his bedroom in her house. Like that is terrifying as a parent, but she just kept working on what she could work with, which was the communication and saved her kid's life as a result. And then the change process has thankfully been continuing because he's alive, um, which is wonderful. <laughs> but um, so I, I just think you can, these strategies can help you in surprisingly different ways and at different times along the journey. And, and it's not about just being, you know, loving and kind all the time. I mean, sometimes you do need to pull back and take care of yourself and say, you know what, I can't actually engage with you right now, because you're being abusive, or you're doing something that is so upsetting to me, I just can't be around it, you know, so it's not just these strategies are not just be loving all the time, right? It's sometimes you have to set limits and have rules and take care of yourself. Um, but it's just about doing it intentionally and strategically is the is the difference um, that I think most people experience, because um, most people are doing their best, you know, like loved ones are just doing their best. Um, but the, the invitation to change gives them a a set of skills that they can learn to kind of employ 
over the, again, over this cycle of trying to help their loved one. Can you give some examples of how an interaction might go between two people uh, that can help them in that process? I'm thinking about when I was reading your book that you gave many wonderful examples of communication and how to have healthy dialogues that were really positive. They keep the doorways open to communicate with each other. Yeah, there's a, again, the communication section is kind of a big section, right? Because there's different things that you're going to want to do. Like there's, um, you know, a strategy that we call the information sandwich, (laughs) which is corny, but is an easy way to remember, like just telling something, giving somebody advice, like you would leave yourself room to be rejected in that space, right? Of like, I don't think you should drink. Your loved one's going to be like, I don't care what you think, right? <laughs> so can are there things that you can do that like open the door? You know, like, are you open to some feedback? So we talk about like asking for permission. Can you knock on the door and be like, hey, can I give you a little feedback of some things that I've noticed? Maybe your loved one says yes to that. Maybe your loved one in that moment says, yeah, not right now. If they say not right now, listen to that red light and don't do it right now. Um, Cause it's odds are it's going to be a fight, you know, or a defensive moment versus like, Hey, can I offer you some feedback? Maybe they say yes. You craft the feedback you want to give them. So we just start trying to help people develop communication strategies that help them ask questions and get the conversation going. Because most times when you're interacting with somebody with a problem you wish they didn't have, you're wanting them to stop (laughs) doing what they're doing, right? Um, You're wanting them to see all this horrible stuff um, and they're just going to shut down and disagree with you. So the communication strategies are all about figuring out how to ask questions that get the conversation going, give feedback in a way that people can hear, using being able to talk about your own feelings in a way that is effective um, and gets your needs met. So there's there's a whole host of communication strategies, um, but they're all linked with your self-awareness, right? Because if you're so mad you're spitting nails, maybe you shouldn't have the conversation right now. You've got to go actually cool off and take care of yourself, you know, or if you're terrified and super anxious, maybe it's not the time for the communication, or maybe you should have your partner do the communication because you're going to fall into tears. Like, again, it's going back to that idea of, can I be strategic in how I'm trying to communicate so that I'm effective um, is what we're trying to help family members do. A big focus here on New Thinking Aloud is psychic functioning and telepathy and intuition and ability to recognize the oneness of which we're all a part. And part of that is that we can pick up on other people's feelings and thoughts and sometimes unknowingly. How much do you think those who are using substances are maybe in a way trying to modulate some of that experience where they might be picking up on uncomfortable or even negative experiences? I've had lots of people that I've worked with um, talk about using substances to because they're so exquisitely tuned in to other people's feelings and emotions, their own emotions, like they just feel things so intensely. Um, And that can be painful, especially if you're in an invalidating environment, you know, so if you're somebody who's like exquisitely attuned, and you're in an environment where there's a lot of misattunement, that's really painful. Um, It can be scary and it can be disturbing. So you will see people turn to substances to just mute that, you know, and silence that, that emotional (laughs) capacity that they have, um, you know, because it doesn't match with the world around them. Um, So oftentimes we are trying to help them if they get the substances out, how do we help you actually honor that, intuition and your emotional capacity and take care of yourself, um, you know, while you, while you have those feelings um, and while you're noticing things in other people um, so that you don't get depleted or um, end up harming yourself because it's too much. And have you found effective strategies to help those who might be considered a highly sensitive person? Yeah. I mean, I think, again, I think different things work for different people, right? Um, You know, I mean, sometimes just even being able to acknowledge that that's your experience, right? Uh, You know, so many people who are 
emotionally attuned grow up in environments where they're told you're too emotional, right? So you've got too big feelings or you shouldn't feel that way. And they get told that people try to talk them out of that intuition. So I think actually just being able to honor it and being able to know like, yeah, yeah, I see that. I feel that this is really happening. It really can help a lot just being validated, um, you know, and uh, just different self soothing strategies, um, you know, being able to know, like, I actually need some quiet time, you know, like I need to actually go inward a little bit and not be so in the world, you know, in feeling all of this, I actually need to protect myself a little bit and being able to know when I need to do that. Um, so it, I, again, I think just different people need different things. And I think also building community, right? Being able to find other people who can talk about these things and have these experiences, which I, my sense is that's what your community is, you know, to just like feel like, okay, I'm not alone in this. I mean, that's the biggest thing for, I think, people, whether it's pr people with substance use problems, the families that care about them, it's really making sure you have community um, and, you know, a place where you feel a part of and feel safe. And that's incredibly important and helpful. And how much does spirituality play a role in helping people with substance issues? For some, it's the main thing, right? Um, for others, not at all. Um, so... <laughs> <laughs> you're always going to have me go back to one size doesn't fit all. It's going to be different for every single person. Um, but I do feel like, you know, substances are numbing. They, they, again, they, they serve a lot of purposes for people. Um, and I think when you take them out, people are often searching for meaning and searching for how to make sense of things and how to understand things and, you know, developing you know, your spiritual path, whatever that may be, where you find something that is just a little outside of yourself um, and something that grounds you and something that is awe-inspiring or hopeful for you. I think that's incredibly helpful for people and important. Mm -hmm. And do you find that those who are dealing with this might feel a sense of isolation or a lack of connection? Very much so. I mean, that's why I said like that. Um, that building community. And, you know, I mean, I think that's one of the things that the 12 step organizations have done masterfully, right? That's an instant community of people who get it. Like they get your experience. They probably had your experience and they've had success, right? So you've got all sorts of role models in that space. Um, so I think that's a very easy place to find a sense of community. If you're somebody trying to give up a substance that doesn't resonate with everybody though. If people don't want to pursue the 12 step kind of path and that doesn't resonate with them for some other way, we, I'm always strongly encouraging them to, okay, that's totally fine, but you got to find your community, right? Maybe that's your yoga class. Maybe that's your faith based, you know, maybe that's your community center with the community elders, whatever it is that you've got to find your people, um, you know, that where, again, where you feel safe um, so that you don't need to turn to substances to get your needs met we got to help you turn to people, <laughs> your relationships, um, and figure out where, where that can happen for you. Can you share a little bit about your research on your invitation for change approach and how it's been successful for people? You can go to our website, um, CMC, cmcffc.org, and um, we're starting to put the research up there where we've got a community in Canada that is tracking its influence on people. You know, the, the research part of this um, is it's in the works. The, and, but we do have all the research on craft community reinforcement and family training, which is there's an enormous amount of research about how that is effective. Um, so craft is in the invitation to change. We've just added these other pieces to it. So we're in the process of, collecting how that impacts people. Um, but, you know, the feedback we get from the people that we train. So we're training lay people, you know, so parents, educators, treatment providers to start invitation to change groups in their community. And these are often people who have gone the Al-Anon route. They've, they've gone the traditional treatment route and they are like, Ugh, it just didn't, it wasn't helpful. And this 
this way of thinking about things is really incredibly helpful to me. Um, the, the feedback we get is like, this has completely changed my relationships. Um, and my loved one is, is changing and I feel better about myself. Um, you know, the, the painful thing that happens, we, we do these trainings and we have a lot of parents whose kids have overdosed actually and died and they want to give back to other parents. And those parents come to the trainings and they, often have this light bulb moment where they're like, had I had these strategies, my kid might be alive, um, which is heartbreaking, you know, to have them have that experience of like, literally, this is a completely different approach than what I was encouraged to do. And I can't believe it. They're able to turn that around in terms of like, okay, I really want to get this out in the world because I don't want other parents to end up in the same place I did. Um, but it's pretty painful. But I'm hopeful that as we get it out in the world more and more, we can shift how people talk about addiction in general. I had a similar experience when reading your books. I, too, attended Al-Anon several years ago for a family member and was told there's nothing you can do. Just focus on yourself. It certainly enhanced my self-development, which I think is important when you're supporting somebody with addiction as well. However, when I was reading your books, I thought, wow, I wish I would have known this at that time. My loved one is still alive, uh, although their use has impacted their health, but they are still alive. And I'm so grateful to share your message here today for that reason. Yeah, thank you for having me. Absolutely. I hope it's helpful to your listeners. Yeah. And because this is so popular at the moment, what are your thoughts about psychedelics and uh, even psilocybin has been being researched for several years now. Um, you know, sometimes people don't come to substances because they're trying to cover something up. Sometimes they want to expand their mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that what's happening with the psychedelics is long overdue and really interesting. Uh, you know, my, my concern about it is that it's going to get rolled out too fast and in a really messy way. And there's going to be people that are going to get harmed by it, but the train has already left the station and that, and it's going to happen. So, I mean, I think, um, I, I think people, again, just being really thoughtful about how you engage with these substances, being very intentional, you know, and I'm just, I'm, I'm a little bit of a skeptic around the there's, we still as a culture struggle with this like quick fix, you know, if I can just, do a psychedelic journey, I'm going to understand myself better and everything's going to change, right? Behavior change doesn't like, it just doesn't happen that way. Um, so people have to be prepared to continue doing the work <laughs> and continue taking that information that they might have gotten from that journey and really practicing intentionally putting it in their lives so their lives can change over the long haul. Um, I, you know, I'm just a behaviorist at heart, just in terms of like feeling like yep, behavior takes time and practice and you just have to stick with it. And I think people, we struggle with that. We're in a very quick fix culture, right? Um, and it's unfortunate. And part of compassion is being more mindful and aware. And so you're suggesting that people maybe, you know, check themselves, check in with themselves on why they're doing what they're doing and how it's impacting them and their relationships. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. You said it perfectly. <laughs> Carrie, is there anything else you want to share about compassion and addiction today? No, I just hope that um, your listeners will read our material and think openly and with curiosity about this problem. We, there, there's so much judgment about this problem. Um, and I think anybody who has been a touch, touched by addiction has had enough judgment, right? They did, that's actually not what they need. Um, and I think if we as a society can bring a lot more curiosity and kindness to the problem, um, and this includes mental health, this includes, you know, I mean, it's, Things are getting better and people be, are being more open about their struggles and just the humanness of it. But with addiction in particular, I think there's just still so much judgment. And if we can soften that and bring compassion to it, I think there'll be less suffering and people can change faster. Yes. Here's to less suffering and more compassion. Dr. Carrie Wilkins, thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you. Thanks so much. 
And for those of you listening or watching, thank you for being with us. Thank you.